Stanley Crystal has been a student of leadership since he first entered the United States Military Academy back in 1972 as a cadet, as a second lieutenant, and all the way up through the ranks to four-star general, commanding forces in Afghanistan. He's seen when leadership works and when it falls short, and he's written about it all in his new book, Leaders, Myth and Reality. Welcome now, General McChrystal from, from Washington. He's joining us now. General, thanks you for being here. Thanks for having me, David. So it's a fascinating book. I mean, it's a, it takes, it's a little bit of a copy of Plutarch, and it takes, pairs these leaders through the years with one special chapter for Robert E. Lee. Uh, and I want to actually jump to the end a little bit and then come back to some of the specifics and how they might apply today. In, in, toward the conclusion of the book, you say leadership is a constantly moving target. The solution that works perfectly one day can be miserably disappointing the next. It feels absurd that being a good leader is a journey, not a destination but it is. What was the sort of journey you observed through these individuals whom you uh, really have a biography for in this book? Well, interestingly enough, I, I also experienced myself. You go through life trying to perfect your ability to lead and you follow lists or behaviors. Then you try to emulate great people you've either followed or you've read about. And it doesn't seem to work because you get in a situation and every situation is too unique and they're also constantly changing. What we found as we studied these leaders is they were all different. Even the people who are in the same fields like Margaret Thatcher and Boss Tweed were both in political systems, but they were extraordinarily different. Two zealots we looked at, Maximilian Robespierre and the, the uh, Jordanian Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, both led movements that were very violent, but they were dramatically different in style and per personality and whatnot. So the reality is leadership is really the product of the interaction of leaders and followers and then the contextual situations around them. And it's always unique. There's no way to, to predict it beforehand. So the most effective leaders are those who are empathetic, they can judge and feel the people around them, but they can constantly adapt to changing situations. I wonder if there are some constants, though, and let me ask you about one of them. When a leader says something publicly, does he or she have to follow through on what they say? And I say this very mindful of some of what's being talked about here in the United States today, for that matter, around the world. Well, let's take a specific example. Uh, when the president says he's going to send troops down to the border with Mexico, you know and I know that there's a law that says that the, the troops cannot do anything that would be considered enforcing the laws in a police fa function. Does a, does a leader get in trouble if he or she says something that they're going to do and they don't follow through on it? Well, there are two answers to it. One, what I wish the case and what the real case is. The answer is no, they don't. The answer is leaders can connect with followers. They can create an expectation. They can fail to live up to it. And if the followers still judge that the leader gives them something they need, whether it's moral or whatever, then the followers will stick with them. Adolf Hitler was still popular when the German generals tried to kill him in the summer of 1944, and he was still popular in the spring of 1945 after 12 years of taking Germany to total defeat. So the reality is we often are a little bit irrational in willing to put up with it. Now, do we wish that was the case or do I wish that was the case? No. I want to deal with people who, when they say something, if it's not correct, at least I believe that they think it is. If they make a promise, I expect them to carry it through or have a very good reason why they don't. But the problem is that's not the reality which we find with many, many leaders. When it comes to the border with Mexico and, and the, the president really ordering troops down there, what sort of pressure does that put on our military as a project commander? They have to obey the commander of chiefs. There's no question about it. We have civilian control of the military. At the same time, this is not the mission that they signed up for. This is not what you went to West Point to do. No, it's not. And I think that every soldier can take a mission as long as it's lawful and go do it cheerfully and loyally. And they can compartment any other feelings they might have. At the same time, because this is a pretty overtly political act in the way that I'm going to send military to the border to, to defend the south wall of the Alamo from an invasion, uh, which, which probably isn't an accurate representation of a column of migrants coming up and trying to get asylum, I think that many people will probably look at it and say, well, I'm not sure this is the right tool for the job. I'm not sure that this is much more than a political move. But they can loyally and, and effectively carry out the mission, which I think at the end of the day will turn out to be building tents so we can provide housing and care 
for what are going to be some pretty tired people trying to get to a better life. So, so General, let's go to a different part of the world and a different aspect of leadership. And that, that is really the question. When does a leader have to work with people, uh, if not befriend people, at least ally with people uh, that they really disagree with? Let's talk about Saudi Arabia right now. Uh, from everything we hear about what happened to the journalist in that consulate in Istanbul, it was pretty horrific. And yet, geopolitically, the President of the United States has to think about things like the Middle East more generally, something you know terribly well. What effects it has on Iran? What effects it has on Turkey? What is a leader to do when what you need to accomplish really requires you to associate with values that you really abhor? Yeah, this is one we're going to run into over and over, and we have in our past. Remember when Adolf Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, suddenly a country which had helped to invade Poland along with the uh, Nazi Germany suddenly became an ally. And suddenly Winston Churchill and American leaders started to have to change the tune on Joseph Stalin. In the Mideast, I think we've got this challenge that in many cases, people who have been, people and countries have been allies and will be allies in the future have systems of governments, they have habits, and sometimes they conduct actions that we, we take great exception to. My belief is what we should do is maintain relationships for the long term, because that's going to be important. But we have to stand up for our values. So we have to be able to, sometimes behind closed doors, look people in the eye and tell them what's unacceptable. And in other cases, it takes a public stance where we have got to make sure that the rest of the world understands that American values are the bedrock upon which we stand. But we're still going to always be dealing with people who see the world differently and maybe have a different value set. We can't be so inflexible in black and white we don't deal with anyone, but we can't be so expedient that we're willing to overlook things which we and, just can't be aligned with. And what are the special problems that could get triggered when, in fact, our military support might be used for purposes that we disagree with? We have one of your former colleagues, General Mattis, now coming out and saying we've got to get negotiating a truce in Yemen because what the Saudis are doing in Yemen, what's being done to the people of Yemen, is just unacceptable. He says 30 days from now, we want to see everybody around a peace table based on a peace fire, based on a pullback from the border, and then based on easing our dropping of bombs. What is the U.S., the leadership of the U.S., what's their responsibility here? Yeah, it's a tough one because the U.S. sells weapons and provides uh, necessary armaments to a number of allies around the world, and sometimes they use them for things we're not comfortable with. And I think we've got to weigh in on those because people at the receiving end of those weapons often think, well, this is the United States actually using this other country as a surrogate to attack us. And, and they buy into that story, whether there's absolutely no truth in it or not. At the same time, I think we've got to be not completely judgmental because just because we disagree with someone's foreign policy doesn't mean we should have the lever over everyone's foreign policy. In the case of Yemen, I think it is time and appropriate for us to put a significant amount of pressure on the Saudis on their operations in Yemen. But I also think there needs to be a significant amount of pressure put on Iran, who is another player in what has turned into a proxy war. And, and finally, General, I can't let you go without talking about Robert E. Lee. That's the one chapter in your book that has only one leader you cover. And this is someone that you really had revered, if that's not too strong a word. But you came to have a different view of his leadership. Yeah, I, I grew up with Robert E. Lee sort of in my life because I grew up near where he had grown up. I went to the same college he did. I went to Washington Lee High School. And the reality was he as a leader was sort of the penultimate example that I wanted to follow and be. I knew I never could be as good as him, but he was a beacon in that direction. But then in the spring of 2017, after the events in Charlottesville, I took a picture that I had in my, my home that my wife had given me 40 years before, and I discarded it. I put it in the garbage. And I didn't do it because I hated Robert E. Lee, but I did it because people coming into my home might interpret that picture as me being associated with white supremacy and causes that I don't agree with. So it was a painful decision. And Lee remains now for me a more three-dimensional character than before. He's not this perfect depiction now. He's a human being who did an awful lot right for the United States through a 32-year career in the Army. But then he made a decision that I think was completely wrong, the decision to go to the South, join the Confederacy, and support the maintenance of slavery. And I think all of us make mistakes in life, and I think we're going to make mistakes in the future. 
We can't overlook them. What we've got to do is factor them into how we judge people and how we judge ourselves.